Good evening, everyone, and bangerang to all fellow Lost Boys, mermaids, and pirates watching this evening. My name is Tammy Tucky, and I apologize for the hoarse voice. The holidays are finally catching up to me. Oh, well. Um, but it's been a couple of years since we've released a Hook podcast episode, and we're very excited to come back and celebrate something that makes us want to crow. Hook. The Ultimate Edition expanded and remastered album, which was released by the La La Land Records. And I actually have a copy here in my hand, but here's a beautiful image of the actual album itself. So tonight, for those of, those of you who are watching live, um, if you look in the live chat, there's a link that will be uploaded and posted there that you can use to enter the competition. And also, well, not competition, it's a contest. Uh, but uh, we would like to have you guys have the chance, if you're in the United States and based in the United States, to win a copy of this album because it's something you can't miss. And you can see the little ticker below. I'll have that up with the raffle copter link as well, too. So you can go ahead and enter the competition. And we'll probably pick a winner around 8.30, 8.40 p.m. Eastern. Now, let's jump into our special guest who is here this evening, the album producer himself. himself I can't talk today. Uh, Mike Mattesino. Hello, Mike. How are you? Hey, Tammy. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. We've been we've been waiting to talk for so long. I know. This is, it's happening. It's happening. I happening. know. We had to keep our mouths <laughs> shut for so long. Right, I so. know. I was so nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to share this, but can't say anything yet. So I was just so pleased because my signed copy is here that you signed for me. So thank you for sending that. Oh, you're I have cool. that right here. And just very excited for this because I think uh, I think there's a lot of 90s kids and I would class, classify myself as one of them who really adored Hook as a film. And I think the music is also very inspirational. It's John Williams. You know, where can you go wrong with his music? But um, let's first, before we jump into Hook, tell me a little bit about La La Land Records. Because when I was just perusing the website, you have you have some records that are, re you know, relevant to, to movies that we all know. And then some that we really don't. So wh where did that begin? Where did Where did that kind of idea grow to build this? Well, I have to speak on behalf of the guys whose label it is, because it's not me. I'm independent. I just do a lot of things for them because they're really, really great. Um, but they're 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 now fully legal. They're 21 years old, so uh, they started 2002, and um, you know, on very modest, humble circumstances, just trying to build relationships with studios and license scores that uh, the two guys there wanted to put out, which is Michael Gerhard and his partner, Matt Burboys. And they've, you know, built a reputation and built on um, solid ethics and standards of production and quality. And, um, you know, composers would, you um, kind of catch wind of it and want to work with them and just over the course of time we just kept they just kept getting um uh you know better and better um yeah it, it was parallel with the changing of the music business really where um the mass market for soundtracks was diminishing and so it made the idea of these boutique uh limited edition labels um more appealing to studios as a way of getting music out there that within internally was not seen as particularly marketable so um yeah. you know it's a very complicated rather boring subject in a way but um you know that's that's basically so just kind of built and built and built when they started it's like for example studios like paramount and universal were completely closed and now they're two of the most open and um um in partnership with them universal actually started a classics program to um, get previously unreleased music out there. Um, and um, along with Hook came two more entries in that series this season, for example. Um, so uh, so this, it's ongoing great relationships with the studios. And um, that's basically who they are, getting film music um, out to the people um, who care. And we cherish and you, do you we cherish work on everyone. Most oh, of course. Do, do you work on most of the projects that they have or or do you do a select few that you really are passionate about? Um, well, at the beginning, um, they would approach me about a few different things, some very modest. Um, but uh, as I recall, um, we started doing 20th Century Fox titles with them. Um, and uh, 
that had been going on since the 90s, but it had moved from a lot of titles on the Verez Saraband label to the Entrada label. And then Nick Redman, who spearheaded the soundtrack program in 1993 at the studio, um, I talked to him about Lala and I said, I think we should do more things with these guys. So we started doing 20th Century Fox stuff with them. Um, and uh, so, I mean, as things got busier, busier and the titles got more prominent, and in particular, when I started doing a lot of John Williams, and they were on board with some of the things we were proposing, um, I tended to get a lot of these um, uh, bigger titles that needed extra care and attention. But of course, they have other people doing projects as well. Dan Goldwasser, Neil Bulk, um, some terrific soundtrack producers will come in and do things for them. And um, uh, I th think where we are at about, they've done over, well over 600 releases, I think. So. Um, Good Lord. That, that's yeah, a lot so of work. I've is, only yeah. released two albums and, and both of them were covers of songs from the Disney company and from other companies. And, and, and for me, it was, it was a long process because I was doing it all by myself, but you have to get all the written paperwork and everything. So, and just getting the approval. So when I knew we were going to talk, I was just, I just was like, I have so many questions because I can't even imagine the monster that this project must have been yeah. because you know, for, for those for those who don't know, um, uh, I know there's a lot of fans watching right now, but for those who are not big fans of Hook, it is not Spielberg's 100% favorite film he's ever worked on. And I, I think uh, it, it's it's kind of almost been like a, 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 like a tug of war just to get information or film clips or deleted scenes or anything about this film, especially the soundtrack. And so my first question was go just going to be, when in this process, like what year did you guys begin at least approaching? I'm assuming you had to approach John Williams and Spielberg just to say, can we do this? And I I, I just can't believe they said yes. But when did you start doing this? And, and what was that conversation like? Well, La La Land Records um, did it initially way back in about 2010 or 11. Um, and at that time, um, there were there were limitations to what was available, but also um, the project that came out in 2012 was driven by the Sony Music Company. So it basically ended up being the original soundtrack album that was on the Epic Records label with additional tracks of what was available at the time. And uh, so I was actually not involved in that, although I was asked at the time by the liner notes writer of that project, Dan Schweiger, who's also very, very well established in the soundtrack community, um, to inquire with Leslie Brickus, the songwriter whom I was friends with and had uh, done work with him on Goodbye Mr. Chips and Home Alone scores and a number of other things um, about the songs. And we made an attempt to include some of them then, but Mr. Spielberg said no at that time. And that was the end of it. That was the limit of my involvement in that release, which left a lot to be desired, even though it was very welcome at the time. So the idea of doing it again actually came up only a few years later. It, it was, it seems bizarre now, um, but it was actually thought of as a possibility for the 25th anniversary, which would have been 2016. But a quick check for any new materials um, didn't turn up anything. And the answer was, well, we just have to take our time and look at a little more, little deeper and see if we can find things. Um, and it ended up taking several more years. We, there was at one point, we, it was thought of for the 30th anniversary, but uh, circumstances intervened to prevent that. Um, so all in all, um, it started actively in 2016, um, by which time I was really, um, had become the go-to guy for John Williams projects. So I was kind of, um, uh, you know, driving the bus at that point. So um, I worked with Sony Pictures to locate everything. And that's when stuff first started to materialize in 2016. But it took seven years all in to finally get it to, uh, <laughs> into the, the where you could really shared with other people. When you say locate, are you actually going into the archives, the physical archives, to find this material? Where are they preserving it? 
Well, uh, it's a complicated long story, but you had the bulk of the scoring masters were used in 2012, which um, were all of the recordings that were up to the point where they completed the original album in 1991. They were separate and um, they were still sitting in New York since 2012, but there were recording sessions after the album was completed so several more sessions went on in November of 1991, very, very uh, late. The scoring was going on uh, very close to the first start of the, the previews. So all of that later scored material, as well as all the pre-recorded material, um, was not coming up um, when Sony Pictures was searching for it. And the reason for that was basically that uh, the movie was made right at the time when the Sony Corporation was coming in to buy Columbia and TriStar. And so the barcoding and inventory methods were all going to be changed. So when things were packed up and sent to deep storage, it was not stored in such a way that one could take a quick look at a database and spot what was where. So the people who work in the deep storage, which is in like Kansas, um, salt mines, um, wow. were going and pulling out the boxes that said hook and when they and taking pictures and sending them to us and when we said yes okay that's a scoring master find any tape that looks like that that's when everything was um sent out to california and we would start to see where the holes were and we would say okay there's a um, roll 17 is missing so you know we just kept having them dig and dig and dig until they found everything once it all came to california we physically lined up the tapes end to end to make sure that uh, we finally had a complete picture of everything that had been recorded for the movie. And it was at that time that Sony, with their new barcoding and inventory systems, finally got everything um, inventoried and databased properly so that we know what everything is. So um, that all started in 2016, like but then came all the work to actually do the assemble and the masters and the approval. So, but, yeah. uh, you know, just finding everything took you know, physically looking, whereas we're so used to today of just click, 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 and there's the data. When yeah, that doesn't is. exist, nope. um, there's no other choice but to like go and physically open up boxes. And there was, I think, a brief thought where I was thinking of getting into a car and driving to Kansas and helping them because you have oh, to wow. have somebody yeah. who knows what the things look like. You know, they're just storage people. So, um, but it, but that ended up not being necessary. They did great work and were very cooperative. And uh, we finally got, uh, we found everything we were looking for. Well, cheers to them for helping out and being a part of the project. Yeah, there's an I Indiana really Jones didn't... element to this work. There really, oh. really is. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. I'm just picturing the ending of, of film number one, Raiders. Yeah. So, so the film there at the end of filming. Um, so Thomas Robert also works on this podcast with me. And he was telling me that the, at the end of filming, there was 140 hours of footage that had been shot. So do you know how many out total hours there was of recorded material for the film? Just not even counting everything that wasn't on the album, but do you know how much uh, might have been there? Or? I'm going to just take a shot and say maybe about 30 or 35 hours. Now that means every single take of every cue. So they may oh, wow. record eight or 10 takes of one piece of music and then decide you know, to create the correct performance, it's bars one through 10 from this take and then bars 11 through 15 from that take. Then it's back to that take for the next 10 bars. And then they stitch together the performance that they want. So um, mm -hmm. of course, as with filming, you do a lot of recording and of things you're not ultimately going to need in search of that perfect performance. So um, that's uh, that's I what I guess. Uh, there was so much data, um, you know, uh, 28 roles i think of just the main scoring masters and then all the pre-recording song material so yeah i'm gonna did, say was it 30 to 35 hours did it have any notes on what was also filmed because we know that there there was a lot more filmed basically another you know just to jump in on here uh, just specifically about the film it was supposed to be a musical and spielberg didn't like how it turned out and kind of edited almost everything out that was a musical part of the film um so there's a lot of missing material and not everybody knows you know what was filmed what wasn't so did you have a, a, like a blueprint of what was filmed to kind of 
compare to what the soundtrack was accompanying or no. how did that work? No, unfortunately, no. Um, when it comes to pre-recording, I mean, that's of course done before you film. So that material would not tell us anything. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, the score will sometimes tell us um, that something was cut um, okay. because the music runs longer than the finished film does. Um, like the track on the album known as Banning Back Home. There's two versions of it, two completely different versions of it, but both of them are much longer than the scene in the film. And so there's an example of um, the, the contemporary opening sequence that uh, there's material there that we've obviously never seen because, you know, John Williams would have scored to a particular cut of the movie of where it was at the time. Um, but that's pretty routine. I mean, the big helicopter uh, rescue scene in Superman, the piece of music is one minute longer than the scene as it was ultimately edited. And we've still never seen that despite long versions of the of the movie being available, we've never seen that footage. So um, this is pretty routine, and, but it didn't really and, tell us um, about anything musical other than we knew what they were planning. Um, and, and you uh, were friends with Leslie. So did you discuss with Leslie before his untimely passing, um, but did you discuss with him all of the songs that he had written and and were you were you were you given like the a-okay -okay by him and john williams and spielberg to have all of the songs originally that were supposed to be in the musical version included on this album well or leslie did they was, say yeah leslie was totally supportive of doing this and uh, he is the one who actually went to stephen in 2011 or 12 to ask him about these demos which were recorded later and could we include them and it was at that time that mr spielberg said no so uh, then when we went on the quest for locating the material, um, uh, I kind of felt that if the whole thing is Leslie Brickus, John Williams driven, and they like what they hear, then we can, you know, see if there can more of a united front of going to Steven Spielberg. And maybe with the passing of a few years, he'd mellow and whatever. And, um, and it was, if it was presented lovingly, you know, so we, we were trying at that stage to just maximize the chances of him saying, okay, about something yeah. that he was obviously had a slight level of discomfort about. So, um, uh, so it was on me to assemble something in a way that was um, going to be very appealing and, and mm -hmm. get it through that approval. And then we hit many, many roadblocks on that front. But uh, we obviously I, I can't even that. imagine. I feel like I feel like when he did West Side Story, he had mentioned Hook in several interviews saying that he had unsuccessfully done a musical. And I'm wondering if revisiting, trying and attempting to do a musical like West Side Story maybe might have brought up a good side of maybe I should revisit this because I think so many of us with this album coming out and, and it's only in CD format, mm -hmm. which is why we always encourage everybody to go to lalalandrecords.com to get their copy. And we are going to give away a copy later this evening. Um, but I, I really think that this might be the spearhead for something more because I, I, I just am so curious as to how it was originally structured because we've talked to many people that worked that had worked on the film. Um, mm -hmm. and, and especially um, Caroline Goodall, who played um, uh, Peter's wife, um, uh, Moira. So I, I want to play, I'm going to play uh, three clips this evening. Um, this one in particular, I, I think it, it's, it's a travesty. After I heard it, when I, when I got the album and I started playing it, I just thought I cannot believe they did not just leave this alone in the film because she had mentioned she sang. I went, what are you talking about? She said, yeah, I sang when you're alone. I went, how is that working? And she, we were trying to figure out how that would fit into the film. But basically this is a short piece that when she's putting the kids to bed, she sings this song. Um, and uh, that's why um, uh, Maggie sings it later on in the film. So right. let's we, just get, play we get a the payoff bit. and not the setup. So it probably would have been better had it been left in. Exactly. And it's beautiful. Like she can sing. And I was like, oh, yeah. this yeah. is great. So let's take a listen. Um, I'm going to put a little image of John and, and uh, Spielberg up on the screen while we listen. So here we go. And that's Hook on the manuscript page. Mm -hmm. There's an angel watching you. Thank you. 
just to give you a little bit of a taste really beautiful just that that's why i i i don't and, and because spielberg is always about tying things back to what you originally saw um in the beginning of the film but that sets up the characters and everything and and uh and just another reason i think i don't know if you had listened to my interview with caroline i'll have to send it to you but I did. No, she I did, did hear it. say oh you did hear it I, mm -hmm. I just i loved her story about how um they added her monologue at the beginning for her to talk to peter about losing that time with your children and i'm like oh it would have been just ideal to kind of add this in with that piece too so when when you heard some of these cut songs what was your initial reaction because you, you had seen hook before i i'm assuming you you were a fan of it or what um your thoughts? well i i admire it for all of the qualities that it has although um i feel that uh, there's a lot of problems with it maybe if i had a um you know, limit it to sort of one little capsule review. I think there's, it's just probably like it's, it's, there's just too much in there. It's like four different movies going. And so um, maybe it's just overstuffed with ingredients, which will, of course will spoil any recipe. So, um, but, uh, um, but, but I certainly, the music to me was just so grand and melodic that that just uh, covered a multitude of sins, I think. So um, So I've always enjoyed yes. it um, <laughs> on that level and on just of, um, obviously, um, Spielberg was passionate about the subject, even if he maybe got a little too carried away um, in mm -hmm. other departments. Um, so uh, now when I heard the material, um, uh, I just was thrilled to find it. I don't, I mean, I, at that point early in the process, I'm not, I don't see myself as making value judgments on something. It's just a matter of finding it and then, okay, this is what they did. Now, how do I present it? How is this going to fit in and, um, and work? Um, so, um, I just, I just was thrilled every time we found something and, um, and to see just how far things had gotten or not gotten. I want to just pick up on when you mentioned West Side Story. That actually ended up yes. ultimately being the reason for um, why this took so long, because um, we were almost oh. we were basically ready to go in the start of 2019 um, after having done the Close Encounters in ET in 2017, and then um, I spent a lot of 2018 working on Saving Private Ryan and Schindler's List, and with Leslie, Doctor Doolittle, um, and. Um, so when all that was out of the way, we were ready to go in 2019. And that was when it was announced that he was going to make West Side Story. And mm -hmm. I worked for many years for Robert Wise. So I had very complex feelings about that. And I knew he always wanted to make a musical. I'm like, OK, but you've picked that one. And I guess because you, it's sort of sacrosanct and you can't go wrong with it because it's such a great musical in terms of structure. So um, right on and on the heels of that it was announced that uh, oh yes he's going to make it but it's not going to come out to the end of 2020 mm. and i thought okay but i just had this thought that um if he's going to be doing this i didn't want him to have his confidence in of in doing a musical shaken by somebody picking the wrong moment to parade the hook songs in front of them and get a no again yeah. So I said to uh, people that worked closely with him, I says, well, I think maybe we should wait. And if it comes out and it's done and it's a success and he's finally made a musical, then there's no shame in parading out the hook songs. But I think if the public had gotten the hook songs while West Side Story was in production, you know, maybe it would have even shaken the audience's confidence in what he was doing to say nothing of his. So I decided to wait. And we thought, okay, we'll just make it the 30th anniversary edition, come out in 2021 with it. Well, then COVID hit, and it was announced mm. that the release of West Side Story is going to basically sit on a shelf and come out a full year later, not till December of 2021. And that pushed us into 2022 before we could actually go to him, even though we had... Um, uh, it all pretty passed. much ready to present. John supporting it, Frank and Kathy supporting it. You know, everybody saying yes, okay. It was just waiting on him. We actually couldn't get it before him to, until West Side Story was West Side History, and so that actually contributed to um, the delay. And only then did I start the process of finding all the singers and getting all the clearances to include these songs. So, all mm. that's why we have the seven years. 
of gestation. And, and it's such a shame because did, did Leslie at least get to hear what the final mix was before his passing or? Yes. Yes. He, yeah, he loved it. And that's what he had made. Um, actually actually certain suggestions about doing, fixing some things and adding some things and changing some order of things. So, um, so it was all a locked thing with his support and with John's support. And it was just sitting around waiting for um, Mr. Spielberg. And it was my idea, which his people really felt was sensitive and the right way to go to wait for West Side Story to get done and come out. I think that's fair. Before him again, because we didn't want another no again after all that time, you know. But he was thinking about it because he had mentioned it in interviews. So, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it was it was not far from his mind. And no. again, I, I would just love to sit down with a man, even just off the record and be like, so just explain to me, because I really, I, I, it must have been a really hard production behind the scenes. That's what I heard. It was just very difficult because it was so big and yeah. so vast. And I, I can understand if something is so unpleasant, it's like, I don't even want to touch this. Right. But I think he has said that his children love it so much just like because they're my, my i'm i'm around their generation time too and we just grew up with it and it's it's so it's it's so so touching to our hearts i think that's just another reason that he probably was like well you know what i mean there's nothing really left to lose now mm -hmm. you know and i and and it's so interesting because some people usually say this would be great as a musical so i'm i'm curious but i think a lot of it tammy was in the presentation and um because it just ended up as this magical thing where we had a certain amount of alternate scoring cues and source music and these songs. And I could have just thrown together bonus sections. Okay, here are the alternates, here are the songs. But it worked together as its own narrative in a beautiful way that nobody that heard it was really expecting. And it ended up taking on a new power um and offering a new pathway into this music and it turned out that the score supported the songs and the songs supported the score so now when you go back and listen to the score this is in the film there's a new level to your appreciation from it. it means other things to it there's a chance to rediscover it as if you're hearing it for the first time and we weren't really expecting that so um i think that actually played a role it wasn't just okay here are the songs but that presentation um you know, what I got was the message that Stephen listened. He thinks it's great. Go ahead. And um, so, you that's, know. That's, that's some high praise right there, Mike. Look at you. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> you don't really ask any questions. You're just like, okay, I got the green light. So just, we, we just go. Ready so. to rock and roll. <laughs> well, let's listen to another clip. This one is the uh, one of the deleted songs, uh, Childhood. And actually somebody in the audience has a question about it, but let's let's listen to it first. Here we go. that's just a little a little snippet of the song and again it's coming from uh the official ultimate edition album which you could see here i have one in my hands and this one we're actually going to be giving away in about 15 minutes um you can actually enter to win the competition the little uh, contest we have with the raffle copter link that is here on the screen and it's also in the live chat um uh, as well with a with a direct link if you would like to check that out you could see it right here and it's also to your i think it's to your right yeah to your right if you're watching on youtube um so here's a question uh from somebody in the audience this is from ea he says have you heard that Julie Andrews recorded Childhood? I, is this something that's true or? Yes, it is absolutely true. And I do have it, um, every take of it. Um, and it was something that everybody asked me to go looking for. Marty Cohen, particularly, who was Mr. Spielberg's post-production post supervisor for a long, long time, remembered it vividly. And Leslie, you know, often told the story about how um, Stephen got the idea of 
having Maggie Smith do the song. So as a favor, Julie Andrews came basically on her way to the airport and went to the studio and recorded as a 90 year old Wendy, a version of it for Maggie Smith to learn. And then I think they filmed it that same day. So uh, yes, wow. there was a very big desire to include it. And in fact, the version that you just pay, played, which was sung by Bobby Page, who's a wonderful LA based singer and has Love demoed her. most of most of Leslie's shows. Um, her version was at the back end of the third CD. We had Julie's up front as the introduction of Wendy. Um, and I was doing this project in the latter stages concurrently with the Sound of Music Super Deluxe Edition, which also just came out. Um, mm. And Julie had approvals over everything to do with that. So, um, but I was in touch with her on it and asked her and she declined to have it included. And she only did it as a favor. It was done very much in um, in a um, Sprexagon speak singing type of style. And it was done basically as a um, sort of a work, a, a piece of work material for Maggie Smith to do. And there, they would have come back and re-recorded it later with someone else's voice, I think, um, had, had the scene stayed in the film. Um, but I understood her reasons because um, she it was not an anonymous singer. It was someone who is a big star whose name attached to it could potentially could be considered to be driving sales of something. And, um, and that wasn't really fair. Um, mm -hmm. So I understood the reasons, even though um, uh, Leslie actually had wanted the Bobby Page version on it because she actually sings it. Julie's was more of a spoken word thing. Um, so when so, so that, that was supposed to be used for for Maggie to kind of to copy because I thought uh, Caroline had said something along the lines of that she had to learn a song too. So Maggie was going to do her own singing, it sounds like, or they I were don't know. Going to use well, it. certainly on the set when they were filming it, she would have to perform it for the camera. And whether okay. whether Julie's was just a was, was was the playback recording, meaning Maggie was meant to lip sync to it, or if it was just for the purpose of learning the song. Um, those details um, seem to have been lost, but um, mm. either way, that was the purpose of that recording. It was basically just um, work materials. Um, so when we couldn't include it, we then um, moved Bobby Page's version up front on the release as the first um, song and the first new song on the presentation. So that's oh, unfortunate. It's yes, yes, I love it, her voice. Yes, me too. Um, so She's yes, it exists. Yes, it was recorded, but Julie was within her right to decline to have it included. Well, we have some other uh, comments. Amateur Eric says, "I love this. Thank you. Oh, we are oh, we're excited. We love to that you're it. watching." <laughs> Brew eight oh five says, "Album has been amazing and will be the next that. time you hear it." <laughs> It's wonderful. Um, Steven says, maybe someday this will finally finally lead to all the scenes being released on a new DVD release. That would be great. And of course, we've heard different stories about that over the years. In the, It was halfway through um, working on this after basically it was assembled that I got the call from Sony Home Entertainment saying that I think there was supposed to be a 25th anniversary blu-ray that then was delayed a little bit or something but it was going to include the deleted scenes they invited me over to look and i was curious as heck to see if any of them were going to tie into the songs and as we know none of them did so i don't know if that's what they found or if that's just what was approved um so uh, I, I think there's something some, something's in the vault there's something, <laughs> in, although, in Mr. spielberg's vault <laughs> Was it Michael Kahn, the editor, who said that it actually didn't exist, like the pirate sequence song, didn't exist as a finished thing that we could just go and find? It was sort of disassembled. So, oh, um, geez. So, That's I mean, quite that doesn't mean that the footage doesn't exist, but we'd have to actually go create it and, you know, someone would have to okay it. Mm. <laughs> so it probably uh, Rob... is in there. It's just probably not something you just go and you can't just order a pizza. You can't and just pull it. Up. Right. Yeah. Uh, Rob Silverman says, I love this theme. I only wish it appeared more often in the soundtrack. I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about the childhood theme. Uh, is... Really? Because it's actually quite, it's, um, you know, we hear it um, as they fly to Neverland. We hear it. It's the big music as Peter learns to fly. It's actually all over the score, that melody. So, and uh, Leslie felt that the song with the lyrics was 
the central song uh, of it, that it spoke to the central themes and ideas for the story. Mm -hmm. um, so he was sorry to see that go. Chris Martin says, it is great hearing the full ultimate war battle music. It is fantastic. The sword fight music is my favorite. Mike, do you have a favorite track on the Gosh, album? Gosh, you know, I, on this score, I don't know that I've ever thought of it. I think I just like that whole remembering childhood and Peter learns to fly sequence just because of the way that uh, it is so subtle and um, sensitive and it has actually a full playthrough of that childhood theme with the solo piano it's absolutely beautiful and how it builds to that great um joyous uh flying sequence i think i think that's just sort of john williams at his at his finest and bruce says i was fortunate enough to see john adams in san francisco this past february and he played flight to neverland live one of the greatest moments of my life well, yes. I'm glad he's at least playing something from Hook because I just I would love to hear the music live too. No, he's done it <laughs> quite a bit, and it's nice that the score, um, despite any you know misgivings about the film, has had quite a good life on the concert stage. And he's did five concert arrangements of it for the Spielberg Williams second collaboration album, um, and uh, that Flight to Neverland has come up quite a few times in concert. My dad's in the audience. He says, I personally think they could re-release it to theaters for a special edition one weekend. I'm sure that would be that would be glorious. I would so be there. <laughs> yeah, it's I great on the big screen. I saw it a few years ago um, when it played um, with John Takas, who co-wrote the, uh, did some of the, the liner notes um, for this release. We went together in Pasadena and saw it a few years back. Well, you know, Thomas brought up a, an interesting question. He says, so in your opinion, do you think Spielberg might have maintained his musical ambitions for Hook if he had more time to make the film without the studio's con constraints on the project? Because that's what uh, it sounds like was happening. It only can be opinion at this point, but I don't think so. I think that there was a carryover from the attempt to do a version of Peter Pan in 1985, 86 that he was going to do as a musical that he then pulled the plug on. Um, and when and and was sort of finished with doing abandoning the idea of doing Peter Pan, but when the script, when Jim Hart's script to Hook came along, um, that was a game changer because now it was about an adult, grown up Peter Pan who was an irresponsible husband and father and had to figure out a way to balance that without losing the childhood spirit. And I think that said, okay, now let's do it. Once they got in there and had the name list actor, and it was going to be a big A-list production. And, um, you know, I think the pull to make it a musical was still strong. So the project set out with the songs that ended up in the film. The um, We Don't Want to Grow Up, which is the staged school production of Peter Pan at the beginning. Um, the Maggie Lullaby, When You're Alone, and the Lost Boys Workout song. So those, the script, original script called for that. When um, it got going and Leslie came in and sat in at meetings, that's when they brainstormed the whole, hey, let's open the Neverland with a big staged uh, pirate sequence musical production. And they went and filmed that. Um, and that apparently went well enough that Spielberg just felt, well, let's that, that's going so well. Let's add more songs, more songs, more songs. So that's when Childhood came in and the, the lullaby, um, because previously the song Mothers was what Maggie was going to sing. Then they got rid of that and they changed it to When You're Alone um, with the Caroline Goodall fragment. Um, and then Hook was going to sing a song and the Lost Boys were going to have another song and then Tinkerbell was going to have a song. So, um, you know, I think, <laughs> it, I think it just reached a point. I actually have a feeling that I think Dustin Hoffman may have spoke up also and maybe told Stephen that this wasn't quite working, that maybe you, um, we shouldn't proceed with it. So at that point, mm -hmm. the plug was pulled and, um, um, you know, we we believe that what was shot was the pirate sequence, childhood, and the, and the When You're Alone fragment. And then the three that were in the film, but everything else was only existing in demo form. And that tells us that uh, it didn't go as far as being filmed. And mm -hmm. I think just, um, you know, it's the movie's already long and it takes actually a long time for us to get to Neverland, something like maybe 45 or 48 minutes. Um, yeah. So um, it was already heavy. And um, you have yeah. part of it is sort of this um, kind of tongue in cheek 
um, in jokey, you know, cameo filled comedy. Then you have sort of the serious family drama. Then you have the big action adventure. So it's like to actually make it a musical, it just would have been, you know, crushed under its own weight. Overwhelming. I, I think he just saw that, you know, um, there's just too many movies here. And so they kept, they pruned it, you know, back to um, as, as spare as it could be and still work. So um, I don't think with more time or support or anything, I think he just kind of saw that it was, you know, an idea worth pursuing, but it really at the end of the day, wasn't going to work. But I, I do feel that um, the third disc, particularly as we have it with the presentation of the songs, um, having had a long time to live with it, um, before it got out there, I was sensing that I think that the sort of the psychological undercurrents in the story come through in it somehow a little more powerfully. There is definitely, as you said before, there is something there. There is um, mm -hmm. a, um, it, like does, magic. it does have a power. The songs actually do have some kind of narrative power. It's just that to try to cram it all into an already big, long movie wasn't obviously not going to work. Well, let's take a listen to Low Below, which was featured as the pirate sequence. I think this was the lead up to meeting Captain Hook himself. And let's take a listen. Here we go. Down in the deep below, full 50 fathoms, dead men are sure to get to sleep tonight. You'll meet your mates below, hail and hearty dead men, dead more than deep or very cheap, dead right. Low below, we're food for all the fishes. Low below, they're having us for lunch. Low below, the fishes can be vicious. Down at fifty fathoms where the wind don't blow. Where the sharks are to your boat, turn your teeth to coral stones, near the brave of Davy Jones, below. I love that. <laughs> Me too. It's so much fun. <laughs> Well, what's so crazy that is that uh, the the part of the song that we know that ended up in the score is actually not the main melody. It's actually sort of a bridge thing, you know? Yes. Um, so uh, it was fascinating. I mean, I love, I was so happy to find that this was in such a finished form um, when we got it, because at least with, it's orchestrated minimally. It's not the hundred piece that it ultimately would have been, but they got it to, uh, it was worked through enough that it, really became an anchor for what I was hoping could work, that we could actually have a build a narrative out of these songs. And I think that went a long way, that it wasn't just a piano, that it actually was a fully fleshed out thing with the pirates and the um, the hook dashers um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and everybody in it, building to that uh, presentation of the hook up the up the ramp and onto the Jolly Roger. Up the ramp. The big moment. That was Thomas. I, I know that was what he was most looking forward to because we've been talking about all the deleted scenes because he loves that. And I love the mermaids because the mermaids had a deleted scene with Smee at the end of the film where he was escaping with them in his, in his little rowboat. So I was curious because... Did Leslie ever write a song for the mermaids? Because oh, mermaids are uh, yes, Did and, he ever? and look, yes. Um, but the, I, I think if there was a character in this movie, a song was considered because very, very late in the game, um, the uh, so all of Leslie's materials have recently been during the past year. Um, the Library of Congress came into archive and library them all, and. Um, the work was done in conjunction with the Film Music Society run by a good friend of mine, Mary Lee Bradford, whose husband, John Berlingame, is like the foremost writer about film music uh, for Variety and published books and all that. But uh, Mary Lee had all the pages about Hook scanned for me and sent so I could see Leslie's mind at work literally every song almost coming together one line at a time and how they all evolved. He wrote it all out in longhand and the pages themselves are like works of art and he would have his blue and his red pens at the ready to you know, write things and he would write at the top the date and where he was, if he was in Acapulco or if he was in England or if he was in New York. Um, and I saw the evolution of this and there were, I can't begin, I haven't processed yet or um, organized in any way a simplified version of just how much 
was done. Not only the nine songs that we have all had probably 20, 30 other, you know, early it versions is. of, um, but there yeah. were a whole bunch of other songs. So, I mean, there were three, four other pirate songs before he landed on Low Below. And um, Believe must have had about maybe 15 different titles and concepts. And at one point it was going to be the, uh, um, and an end credit song. And, um, uh, and to me was going to have a song with the mermaids in that boat at the end. And at one point, <laughs> okay, well, he'll redo um, like a version of stick with me. So, I mean, there was so much written. I mean, Leslie worked nine months on it and we've got well, over 200 handwritten pages of all the work he did on it. Massive amount of uh, work and probably, you know, another, um, 15 or 20 songs in there that were had lyrics written for them that had, did not get to the melody stage. Brilliant though, because he, he, he uh, that just a sad moment not to be able to talk to him about this because I'm sure it sounded like he was very invested and involved and excited for this to come out. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad you were able to, to work on this. Um, we have a question from Justin who says, what are your thoughts on banning back home? It sticks out as feeling totally out of place with the rest of the score. Well, Justin, the um, the actual Q manuscript title for that is Yuppie Sounds. And this is the early 90s, remember. So I think that um, uh, it's supposed to stand out because this is the real contemporary world. And John Williams saved the more um, traditionally scored things for after we get to London and when we meet Wendy. So I think to have that separation of Peter's adult contemporary life then contrast that with um um the london sequences and then further contrast that with a more fantastical approach for once we get to neverland i think that was by design it makes you wait for whatever the big john williams themes are going to be in this score and um doesn't give things away too soon and and completely um contrasts things with what your expectations are um, by um, scoring that contemporary sequence in that way. I think it's meant to stick out. Oh, I, I think so. I actually, I, I enjoy it because it gives me that 90s vibe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so many other movies that were taking place during the 90s at the time. So I really enjoy it. And kind of, he's channeling Dave Grusin there. And, you know, I would say and more of an homage to an existing Dave Grusin piece, really. But, um, yes. <laughs> uh you know, it, but it, but it works for what that is because you're you're you because your your mind should say, well, how can this guy be Peter Pan? This doesn't look or sound anything like Peter Pan. So um, polar opposite, <laughs> right? So I think that was by design. Well, we do have a, a winner that we can announce. I just sent you the the name. So if everybody can give a a, a big drum roll for Mike and uh, go ahead, Mike, who is the winner of a copy of this wonderful album? That winner would be Robert Silverman. Congratulations, Robert. Bang a rang. Woo. I'll send you an email um, after our broadcast and uh, we will, we will get this over to you ASAP so you can, enjoy it and, and and again for anybody who wants to get their own copy please go to la la land records.com um and that link is also in the show notes below and it, it, it's it's a wonderful work of art because and i can't keep track of whether it's in stock now or not because i keep hearing that the bat next batch came in and that they're selling out again i mean we haven't seen anything that's great news this though <laughs> this is actually really big news in the soundtrack world and the love for it is just so inspiring um, to, I am to glad it's being sold out. This is good news. So even if it is sold out, everybody keep a tab on that, that uh, keep a bookmark. Yeah. On that and website. it will, it will it come back. It's back. just, you know, it will come back. It's just, they can only work just so fast to um, get this out to everybody. And I think that if it sells out, they'll do a new license and get more. Bruce says worth every penny. I love it. <laughs> Um, let's end with one more question. Actually, this one's from Brew, and I think it's a it's a great question to end um, with Mike today. What are your most What are you most proud of while, while of putting this album together after everything's finally one and done? Well, I think that I'm. I, I would have to say that it's um, that it could stand as a. Um, uh, a a great capper to um, celebrating the the 
John Williams, Leslie Brickus collaboration, which goes back to the mid sixties. Um, and I think what I said before, the fact that by getting these songs and um, that it worked, it could be presented as a narrative. We actually get a picture um, of like, we, have, we get a concept album for the musical that never was, is how I think I said it in the liner notes, that we got that rather than just a bunch of bonus tracks stuck at the back end of a score, that we actually got something with a new life of its own and a new pathway into the music. I think that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, it was it was such a joy to f to listen through it all the way through. I just sat there in my room and listened to the entire thing, and I, I it was it was so joyful. It was a great Christmas gift gift too. So I love that, and and thank you for having Thomas and I be a part of the credits and and the special thanks in the in the album. I was so shocked when Thomas told me. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like amazing. I'm very honored, and and just really extremely blessed that uh that this has come out so thank you so much yeah you guys are so, such work. great uh torch bearers for this movie and and it needs it you know and um thomas's great collection of imagery and everything and then and the knowledge and because we had to do a lot of again as i said before it's an indiana jones thing so you've got to go to other archaeologists and see what pieces of the puzzle they can give you and um you have people with 30 something year old memories here. So, you know, we're grabbing little pieces and ultimately we get a, a whole picture or as, as, as whole a one as we can get. And that's what we've done there. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm very grateful for everybody who contributed a little piece. It, it's wonderful. And we have another interview hopefully coming up next month for starting 2024. We'll talk a little bit more about that because we've been waiting a year to do that one too, just like we've been waiting a year to talk to Mike. So I'm glad we we finally got to talk. This was great. Um, thank you so much. Again, lalalandrecords.com. Please go ahead and get your copy. Um, if it is sold out, just bookmark that tab because it will be back in stock, as Mike said. Um, so any final words, uh, Mike, before we, before we uh, head off to Neverland ourselves? <laughs> um, I'm ready for my night. Cap. <laughs> uh, I'll drink to that. Let's let's go ahead. You have yours. I do. Ready to <laughs> uh, go. Here we go. Cheers. <laughs> this was great. Uh, low below, everybody. Thank you guys so much for watching. We had a wonderful um, audience watching. Thank you guys all for tuning in and chatting along with us, spending some time. Um, we'll have some more information coming up soon. If you have any questions or anything else, comment below, send us messages. I'm sure you can find Mike and La La Land Records. They have social media pages as well, too. I believe I put them in the show notes. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Tammy Tucky. Um, so we hope to hear from you all soon. Um, happy holidays. Happy New Year. Yes, Thank happy 2024, again, everybody. Thank you all so much. Woohoo! Bye, everybody. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> hey, thanks, Tammy. <laughs>